Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for OE Week 2023. My name is Yuna, and I'm an OE Week coordinator. Please note that this session is being recorded. OE Week is presented by four sponsoring organizations. First, the Global Oceanification Observing Network. Second, the United States National Oceanic Auto Atmospheric Administration. Third, the International Atomic Energy Agency, Oceanification International Coordination Center. And last but not the least, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. Goan was established in 2012 with just a handful of members. Since then, Goan has grown immensely. It now has over 1,000 members from 114 countries. Goan also consists of nine regional hubs, which span across continents and oceanographic regions. We will be hearing from most of them throughout OA Week. If you are not a member yet, you can join Go On today by visiting GoOn.org. OE Week debuted in 2020 and returned in 2021 when events and conferences were postponed due to COVID-19. Following the successful in-person symposium on the ocean in a high CO2 world in 2022, Go on is bringing back OE Wake 2023 to maintain momentum around OE research and provide a virtual platform for the ocean acidification community to exchange their latest fundings. We are thrilled to present a wide range of ocean acidification topics and speakers from around the world. During the presentation, all participants are in listen-only mode. You're welcome to type any questions into the question box, which can be found at the bottom of the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. We will be monitoring incoming questions and we'll post them to our speakers during the question and answer session, which will begin immediately after the final presentation. For the discussion, you can also use the raise hand function in the toolbox at the bottom of your screen, and we will call on you to ask your question directly. And with this, I would like to introduce you to our moderator for this session, Dr. Anita Franson. Dr. Anita, An An Anita Franson is a chemical oceanographer and senior research scientist at Norwegian Polar Institute and professor at the University Center in Salvard, working with observations on ocean sea ice biogeochemical process, ocean acidification and effects of climate change in the Arctic Ocean and fjords, and is co-leading the Goan Arctic Hub. Anita? Would you like to share your screen and uh, tell me more about this hub? Thank you. Okay. Do you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay. Presentation mode. Thank you. Thank you, Yumeng, for the introduction. And uh, welcome, I would say again, to the Arctic Hub session. And uh, uh, we will have a great uh, speakers. Uh, tonight that will uh, or today uh, that will uh, present new insights into various aspects of uh, ocean acidification such as observations case studies uh, biological effect studies and modeling and um, uh, we in the that has uh, arranged this uh, session are the go on arctic hub steering uh, science steering committee and it consists of, uh, of myself and also of Melissa Kierci from the Institute of Marine Research in Norway, and also Kumiko Asetsu Scott in, uh, in, uh, at the fishery of uh, oceans and um, in Canada. And it's also uh, Jessica Cross that is, uh, oh, sorry, uh, that is uh, not uh, uh, longer yet NOAA, but she moved now to Department of Energy. 
So yeah, as you said, uh, you can uh, to become an Arctic Hub member, you can contact Go On, but you can also uh, contact us directly. Uh, and uh, I'd like to just introduce the program for tonight. And uh, first, we have the speaker, Tonya Burgers, uh, that we talk from Canada, that talks about drivers and argonaut saturation state in Baffin Bay, with a focus on the West Greenland Shelf. We have uh, Johanna Langer from Canada. Uh, talking about modeling and on a modeling perspective on ocean acidification in the Canadian archipelago. We have Griselda Anglada Ortiz from Norway. Uh, we present ocean acidification effects on calcifiers in the Barents Sea. And Sam Rastrick from Norway will uh, present ocean, acid ocean acidification and the biological impact of metal pollution uh, in the in a fjord in Norway, northern Norway. And we will also have uh, Anna Nikolopoulos uh, from Norway uh, present uh, the Panarctic Distributed Biological Observatories. And at last, Piero Calosi from Canada will uh, present the population variation in the sensitivity of Arctic marine organisms to ocean acidification. And uh, finally, we will uh, end the session with questions and answers and some discussion if we have time. So yeah, so now uh, go. we will continue with the first speaker, Tonya Burgers. So thank you. Thank you very much for the great introduction, Anita. We are very excited about this session now. So now I would like to introduce briefly about our first speaker, Toya. So Toya is a PhD candidate at the University of Manib Toba. Her research is focused on understanding the biogeochemical processes that drive the marine carbon cycle in Norris Strait and Barbon Bay, part of the Canadian Arctic Archipelago outflow shelf of the Arctic Ocean. So now, Toya, the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much, Yumeng. Let's just share my screen here. Uh, and put it in presenter mode. Okay. Uh, can you just confirm for me you can see my screen, Yubang? Yes, it works perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so as was mentioned, uh, my talk is called Drivers of Aragonite Saturation State in Baffin Bay with a focus on the West Greenland Shelf. Oh. Here we go. All right, so the setting for this study is Baffin Bay, um, which is an important part of the Canadian Arctic Archipelago outflow shelf. So Baffin Bay receives cold and fresh Arctic outflow waters from the Canadian Arctic Archipelago channels. And this cold, relatively fresh water flows southwards as part of the Baffin Island current through Baffin Bay and into the Labrador Sea. On the other side of Baffin Bay, we have the entrance of relatively warm and salty modified Atlantic waters that move northwards along the West Greenland shelf. Um, and both of these currents combined create a cyclonic circulation within Baffin Bay. Um, the data set I'm gonna to present today was collected as part of an Arctic net cruise on the Canadian Coast Guard ship Amundsen from July 5th to August 15th in 2019. And you can see from the station dots on this map, we had a really good coverage of Baffin Bay in this particular year. Uh, and what was new and important was the amount of stations we had on the West Greenland shelf, which has historically been uh, much less sampled compared to the Canadian side of Baffin Bay. So that's going to be the focus of today's talk. Uh, the research objectives for this study of mine are looking at uh, first, what are the biogeochemical processes that control aragonite saturation states in Baffin Bay? And second, to provide an update to historical measurements of aragonite saturation state in this region, uh, such as those that were presented by Azetsu Scott et al. in 2010, and the distribution of those historical sampling stations is shown here uh, on the map from this paper, from the Azetsu Scott paper. Okay, quickly, uh, the methods that I used to look into the different water mass distributions in this region 
is firstly, I distinguished Arctic outflow waters from Atlantic waters using the ratio of dissolved inorganic nitrogen to phosphate. And secondly, I further distinguished freshwater inputs from meteoric waters and sea ice melt using stable oxygen isotopes and salinity measurements. Getting into some of the results now, um, here I'm showing surface distributions of freshwater inputs from sea ice melt, meteoric water, and Arctic waters in the top three panels. And the bottom three panels are showing the CO2 system uh, parameters, dissolved inorganic carbon, total alkalinity, and the aragonite saturation states. So we can see here that sea ice melt fractions are greatest in the western and northernmost regions of the study area, where sea ice is known to persist the longest. Uh, we also have some meteoric water inputs that are entering from the channels of the Canadian Arctic archipelago, uh, but also there's meteoric waters shown in the major West Greenland fjord systems like Disco Bay and Umanak Fjord uh, down here. Um, the fractions of Arctic waters show a very clear east-west divide across Baffin Bay, and this is because of the two major current systems. The West Greenland current shows very low fractions of Arctic water, whereas the Baffin Island current flowing south shows uh, the prevalence of Arctic water there. In terms of the CO2 system parameters, we can also see a clear east-west divide here with the West Greenland current surface waters having a higher total alkalinity to DIC ratio, which leads to the higher values of aragonite saturation state there compared to in the Arctic outflow waters uh, closer to Baffin Island on the Canadian side. Okay, looking now at stations on the West Greenland shelf, these are section plots that show um, parameters throughout the water column from Davis Strait in southern Baffin Bay uh, going northwards towards Melville Bay on the northern end of the West Greenland shelf. You can see on the left side of each panel is Davis Strait in the south, and on the right side is Melville Bay to the north. So first, I'd like to just focus on the top two panels, which show temperature and salinity distributions. Uh, it's known from previous literature on the West Greenland shelf that there are two main water masses present here. First, there's Baffin Bay polar water, which is shown by the very cool temperatures below minus one degrees Celsius, and salinity is around 33.5. We can see these cold waters are present mostly on the northern end of this transect. And Baffin Bay polar water is a winter uh, mode water, which is formed by cooling and convection. Um, and then we have Atlantic water below that, which has relatively warm temperatures above one degree Celsius and salinities greater than 34.3. And you can see that the temperature of this Atlantic water is also decreasing from south to north on this transect. Now, if we look at the fractions of Arctic water, we find relatively high fractions of Arctic water to be present in the Baffin Bay polar water layer. This is suggesting that there is a circulation of Arctic outflow waters from Western Baffin Bay onto the West Greenland shelf. And this is novel and hasn't been documented before, so I found it quite interesting. Now looking at the CO2 system parameters, here we can see at depths below 150 meters, the aragonite saturation state decreases from south to north on this transect, and it coincides with increasing dissolved inorganic carbon and increasing apparent oxygen utilization. And both of these parameters increasing suggests that this decrease in aragonite saturation state is due to the respiration of organic matter at depth. Now, if we take a Baffin Bay wide view of the drivers of aragonite saturation state, uh, on the left plot here, we're showing dissolved inorganic carbon on the x-axis and total alkalinity on the y-axis, and the data points all across Baffin Bay are colored according to their aragonite saturation state. And what's interesting is we can see the east-west divide present in this plot as well. Um, so in the west is um, close to Baffin Island, where the Baffin Island current uh, is transporting Arctic outflow waters. And we can see that those waters have a much lower aragonite saturation state compared to Eastern Baffin Bay, where the West Greenland current uh, is, is present. And the aragonite saturation state is, is relatively high over there. 
this is shown again um, in the top plot on the right side of the screen where we've just isolated the upper 150 meters of the water column. And you can see uh, that those data points that coincided with low aragonite saturation states over here do in fact have relatively high fractions of Arctic water, whereas the high aragonite saturation states over here coincide with low fractions of Arctic water. So that is the main driver of aragonite saturation states in the upper 150 meters of the water column. If we look below that, below 150 meters, the aragonite saturation state is mainly controlled by the amount of respiration that has occurred. And this is shown by this uh, very strong relationship between aragonite saturation states and apparent oxygen utilization. And now I'd like to look at some temporal changes in aragonite saturation state across Davis Strait. Uh, we decided to focus on Davis Strait in particular because it was sampled consistently between the historical years and our 2019 data set. So it's a good place to do a proper comparison. Um, here, we observed a strong interannual variability in the aragonite saturation horizon, which is where it's equal to one. Um, and this variation was mostly due to the distribution of water masses slightly changing from year to year. You can see the um, relatively warm Atlantic water uh, is present on, on the West Greenland slope and shelf, whereas the temperatures below minus one is the Arctic outflow waters exiting from Baffin Bay. Um, in most of the water masses in Baffin Bay, we didn't observe any significant changes in aragonite saturation st states between these years. But the one water mass that did show a difference was the Arctic outflow waters. So here I've listed the um, mean and standard deviation of the aragonite saturation states in Arctic waters in each year. And you can see that there was a significant decrease from the historical years of 1997 and 2004 compared to 2019. So in summary, I've shown that Arctic outflow waters, um, which contain a significant portion of Pacific fractions, show the largest, sorry, show the lowest aragonite saturation state values due to their low total alkalinity to DIC ratio. Uh, we found Arctic water fractions in the Baffin Bay polar water layer along the West Greenland shelf suggesting that Arctic water fractions are present where this winter mode water is forming potentially. Um, at depth, there's a strong relationship between aragonite saturation states and apparent oxygen utilization, signaling that the respiration of organic matter plays a major role in determining aragonite saturation states at depth. And we found a significant decrease in aragonite saturation states of Arctic waters from 1997 and 2004 compared to 2019. Thanks so much for your attention. And I've listed my email address as well if anyone has further questions or would like to chat about this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tamiya, for your great presentation. It's such a nice start. And now I would like to introduce our second speaker. Uh, let me share my screen. So our second speaker is Johanna. Johanna is also a PhD candidate at the University of Victoria in BC, Canada. Her research focus is on the carbon sink potential in the Canadian Arctic archipelago. Using numerical modeling as a tool, she, she investigated the surface ocean's carbon budget, the current state of aragonite saturation states, and the sensitivity of the model system. So from here, would you like to start your talk, Johanna? Hello, thank you for the introduction. I hope you can see my screen well. Yes, we can see it well. Okay, so yeah, I have a long title here. Um, basically, I'm talking about how a modeler sees the carbon system in the uh, surface waters of the archipelago. 
I would like to give a shout out to my supervisors, Nadia Steiner and Adam Motherham, and as well as to our technical assistant, um, Tessa Su, who has helped a lot to get this talk running. Um, so getting started, um, background, yeah, we all kind of know that the Arctic Ocean has low aragonite saturation states, um, and that it's very vulnerable to ocean acidification. So for example, back in 2021, Andrea Nimi et al. found that the pteropods are already affected in certain times of the growth stages by corrosive conditions. So it's kind of known that the aragonite saturation states are quite low. General, in the Canadian archipelago, we have the additional issue that um, there's a low salinity, which kind of translates to lower buff buffering capacities. Um, and then this is home to the so-called last ice area. So the last area where we will expect uh, sea ice being able to survive the summer. Um, it's a strong coupling to land because there's just a lot of land mass compared to ocean area. And it's generally shallow waters. So there's a very strong coupling to the um, surroundings. Also, the hydrology is quite interesting in there. So um, I'm just going to put this here. This is kind of the reference card for the model. If you want to take a screenshot and look at it later, go for it. It's just to give an overview. So basically, I'm talking about the canoe model, which is the Canadian Ocean Ecosystem model with the CS IOG chemical implication. Um, so yeah, this is just the technical details. I would like to think about the model more in this situation. So I circled in red here the river and terrestrial runoff and the atmospheric forcing. So both of these are forcings that are affecting the model that are added to the runs from outside. And then I have this example grid box here. So um, basically we have this huge DIC pool that circles through various uh, phytoplankton and zooplankton and detritus parts to kind of have the biology in there. And then the model is very special because it has sea ice algae implemented, which affects the seasonality. And it also has a DIC flux connected to sea ice formation and brine um, deposition. So the DIC is basically deposited below the mixed layer depth, which is basically making the surface uh, part of the model way more realistic. Um, to note, in each grid cell, the volume is conserved. I'm going to get back to that later. And the currency for the carbon chemistry is basically alkalinity and DSC. That's how everything else is getting um, calculated. So one note ahead, I did a little bit of a model validation and we know that there's a bias in alkalinity, um, DSC and salinity. So as you can see here, the observed values for alkalinity and DSC over depth. So this is a spatial average of all the observations in the Canadian archipelago compared to the respective model values is higher. So we know this, um, but the ratios are working out quite well. So um, we can get a relatively good agreement, uh, especially on a monthly scale. So if you look at the bottom part here, picture C, so the PCO2 especially, which is amazing news, if you get on the monthly scale, the model is actually very capable of being accurate. And we also found that regional and seasonal pa patterns have been um, modeled quite well, the model output uh, replicates them quite well. So the values might be a bit low, but the general picture is very good and very useful. So as I mentioned, DIC and alkalinity are kind of the currency, the basis for all the calculations. So I ran a little bit of a DIC oh. budget. Um, so what affects the DIC budget, and this is in the top row of the figures here, um, is basically the net primary production in pelagic and ice algae biomatter, um, the RC gas exchange, the DIC contributions by runoff, so what is brought in with runoff, and what's happening in terms of remineralization. And as you can see in the bottom here, the terrestrial input, which is a surface um, input, is about the same size as the whole um, averaged over the water column of the top 60 meter water column in these regions in terms of net primary production, which I find very interesting. Further, I would like to show that uh, in the bottom row here, I have a difference between freshwater adjusted and not freshwater adjusted. So the freshwater budget, what comes in in terms of rivers affects the concentration because the volume is conserved. Um, so the blue line shows the normalized DSC where this 
freshwater effect has been reduced. And as you can see, it really affects the seasonality of the DIC concentration in the water column. So it also shows that during the times when all the other sources and sinks for DIC are kind of um, low because it's winter time, for example, the sea ice growth and the actual freshwater flux that's connected with this affects the DIC in the surface waters. So if I look at the um, actual sea ice carbon flux in the top, um, uh, the actual air sea flux of carbon in the top row, and then the PCO2 delta between atmosphere and top of the ocean water column and the ice cover, it's kind of showing that this variability is also in there. Um, I want to highlight that, especially in Coronation Gulf, there's a strong inc uh, increase of PCO2 in seawater compared to the atmospheric value. So a strong CO2 oversaturation below the ice in winter, which is connected to this formation of sea ice. So based on this and the DIC budget terms I've just showed, basically the sea ice cover affects the carbon budget in the top water quite a lot, just because the way the flux is implemented with the sea ice cover preventing flux. And as you can also see in Barrow Strait, for example, the interannual variability of the sea ice translates well to the variability of the flux. Um, then we do have to think about the freshwater budget, so rivers coming in and out. Um, sea ice melt includes in there. And then things like temperature and net primary production start to have an impact on the surface carbon um, too. So the to show the difference between certain ways. I have a, um, so these transects here, I'm showing the where it runs here in the blue line at the bottom. This is the monthly mean values from 2005 to 2015, um, all averaged together. And I'm showing for the month of July to September. And as you can see, I have two runs. One has no nutrients in the rivers. One has nutrients in the rivers. And in the top row, you can see the aragonite saturation states. And this affects the so the, the amount of nutrients and how the freshwater and the river inflow is create is set up really affects the aragonite saturation states. It further affects the salinity here in the center and the ratio of alkalinity to DRC, which Tonya just highlighted as one of the reasons that aragonite saturation states are the way they are. So I want you to have the slide in mind when I jump to the next one, because one of them is starting for um, especially the no nutrient run and the other one is the nutrient run. And they are used to start certain RCP and SSPS runs. So here I'm showing in blue and green the RCP runs for 4.5 and 8.5, and in yellow is the SSPS 585 run. And the RCP runs are started from the no nutrient run, and they have no nutrients in the river reinforcing. So the aragonite saturation state initially are already quite low. What I'm showing here is the change from the initial decadal mean. So the starting point of the model where we used re, um, pine casts and um, available forcing products where we started to go and look into the future forcings. So it's not the actual values because they are not very comparable, but I'm showing the anomaly basically. So to remind, you, the, the nutrient treatment has a huge effect, but what we can also see here that um, especially once the sea ice is gone and around 2030, um, the RCP 8.5 and the SSPS 5, uh, 585 are not that different in terms of slope, how the aragonite saturation behaves from the respective parts. So that is another indicator that the whole freshwater budget and everything has potentially a larger effect on the aragonite saturation states than the atmospheric forcing. Also, we have to um, compare, like look at smaller scales. So if you look at the whole Canadian archipelago compared to the uh, very much smaller subset coronation gulf, which is in the bottom here, it affects a lot. So um, basically what I want you to take away from my rambling here is uh, reverse matter and the freshwater budget is an issue that models have to deal with and have to improve still. But then also the current aragonite saturation values are already below uh, the value of one regularly in certain parts of the Canadian archipelago and that the surface carbon chemistry is mostly 
affected by ice cover and freshwater budget, according to this model. So that's my skill. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, Johanna. It's a really uh, brief but very to the point presentation for us. Uh, so next, I would like to have our third speaker. Um, our third speaker is Griselda. And uh, a little bit about Griselda. She's a PhD candidate at the Department of Geoscience in the Arctic University of Norway. Her research interests include planktonic marine calcifiers, their role in the carbon cycle and their use as proxies to reconstruct past environments. Currently, she's working on how those organisms live in the Arctic in a seasonal basis and the effects that ocean acidification might have on them. So now over to you, Griselda. Okay, yeah, no, I'm not working on that. Um, Grisada, are you are you here? Oh, uh, I think you're yeah. muted. Oh, uh, no, yeah, I think now it's you. working. <laughs> Sorry, it took a while. Um, no worries. Thank you, Yuming. I think now you can see uh, the presentation uh, properly. Yes, we can see it very well. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so, as you Meng said, uh, I will be talking a little bit about seasonality of marine calcifiers in the Northern Barents Sea, and those are the results of a paper that we recently published, part of the Nansen Legacy Project. Yeah, but first I would like to start with this plot that we all uh, know and have seen several times uh, about the decrease of uh, pH in the global ocean and how it represents an increase of acidity in the water. And we know that it has the, the ocean acidification has the capacity to affect uh, marine life. And what we are interested mostly is uh, the effect on marine calcifiers, um, that there are organisms made of uh, calcium carbonate. And in this paper, we have mainly studied, we have only studied actually, uh, foraminifers that are protist with a shell made of calcite and pteropods that there are gastropods and they have a shell of aragonite. And um, because they are um, more susceptible towards changes in the environment, they have been named as the canary on the coal mine for ocean acidification studies. Um, also a little bit about the biological carbon pump. When we think about it, uh, we usually think about the organic uh, part. So by the CO2 uptake from the atmosphere to the ocean and light, the primary producers create organic matter and it's transferred to bigger organisms and uh, potentially sinking uh, to the seabed. Mm, but also in, in the case of marine calcifiers, they also have an important role exporting inorganic carbon on, in form of calcium carbonate to the seafloor when they die and sink. Um, so as part of the Nansen Legacy Project, we have been uh, studying seasonally this transect from the Northern Barents Sea. We have seven stations. P1 is the only one below the polar front and it's the Atlantic station. Then we have P2 to P5, the Arctic stations and the northernmost P6 and P7, they are uh, influenced not only by Arctic but also Atlantic uh, waters. And here you can have a, a look at how the different sea ice conditions looks through the five different cruises. And we see that P1, it's the only one that is free ice. And then the different stations are sea ice covered uh, differently through the year. Um, when we want to study um, planktonic uh, marine calcifiers, we usually use this multi-net that it's a stratified net and allows us to collect um, up to five different uh, depth ranges in the water column. And we are focusing on the upper 300 meters of the, of the ocean because it's where they um, inhabit. Uh, once we have the samples on board, we um, divide the samples into four size fractions and we pick organisms alive to extract their protein. And that's important for us because the protein is a proxy of organic carbon. 
So based on that and the abundances, we will calculate the organic carbon. And when we measure the size of the shells and together with the abundances, we will have the estimates for inorganic carbon. So here it's a, a little list of the results that I will uh, show you in, in a bit. So first you would see the seasonal abundances of the both groups and how the size changes seasonally and how the three uh, together with protein content in, it resulted in our estimates of carbon standing stocks and export production. So uh, here you can see the, the abundances of planktonic foraminifers. Um, here you have the stations listed from P1 to P7. So here is the northernmost station and the seasons from March, so from winter, going to spring, summer, till autumn. Um, and in the general trend that we can see here is that uh, the larger abundances and sizes were found in summer, that is these two months, July and August, and the northernmost stations P6 and P7. What surprised us uh, quite a lot was to see this jump between March and May. As you can see here, we found barely any uh, organism alive in the water column when we went in, in March. And several weeks later, we went there and we've seen like a, quite an increase on the abundance. Um, and we wonder how would that be? And in the paper, our explanation for this um, variability uh, was that the um, was a combination of the sea ice nursery role and the Atlantic inflow. So in winter, um, planktonic uh, calcifiers and mainly foraminifers would get trapped in the sea ice. Um, so that's why we barely found any in the water column. And when the sea ice would start melting, uh, some of those organisms would fall in and grow into the water. And also in spring, we find a larger Atlantic inflow. So they would be also advected through those currents. Um, and here you can see the same uh, type of results, but in case of theropods. So again, these stations listed from the southernmost to the northernmost and the different seasons. Here, for instance, uh, what you can see, it's the in case of theropods, we found way more in even in winter. And in general, we found the larger abundances and sizes in late summer and autumn and enclosed in the stations P2 to P5 that are the Arctic stations. Um, when studying the, the sizes of both groups, we observed a very nice trend that increased from March till December um, in both cases. And we didn't find any significant uh, differences between the whole 300 meters of the water column or the upper 100 or below 100 meters. And it was interesting to see if there was any differences between these two depths to see if there was a ontogenic vertical migration. So if there would be organisms below 100 meters, that would be larger, or there would be the adult version of the juveniles. But we didn't, we didn't observe that. Um, so based on the abundances and sizes that I've shown you, uh, we found or we estimated the standing stocks that is here on the left and the export production on the right. Um, these, um, these plots are combining the results of organic and inorganic carbon and the results from forums, foraminifers and theropods. And what you can see uh, quite easily is that both in both cases, they increase from uh, March till December as the sizes do. And if you have a look at the plots here below, you would see that the highest um, standing stocks and export production would be found within this P2 to P5 uh, stations, that is the seasonal uh, ice margin. And it's also where we found the highest abundances of uh, theropods. So what we have observed um, is that theropods contribute way more to the uh, carbon dynamics, um, which 
because they are way more affected or they are expected to be more um, affected due ocean acidification, we would uh, think that this region would, um, would experience a decrease of um, standing stocks and export production under ocean acidification. Yeah, so uh, the main conclusions of the study is that we have found a clear seasonal pattern in terms of size distribution, abundances, standing stocks, and export production of calcifiers. We've seen the highest values in summer and autumn and the lowest in winter. We have seen that the highest standing stocks and export production of calcifiers are uh, within the seasonal and marginal ice zone at uh, all seasons. Um, Compared to phytoplankton bloom, we suggest a delay of the highest abundances, size distributions, and therefore the associated carbon standing stocks and export production. And the changes or variability on the abundances of foraminifers from winter till spring could be due a combination of the sea ice nursery role and the increase of Atlantic inflow. And we have seen differences between stations the Arctic were dominated mainly by uh, theropods and the Atlantic by foraminifers. And this dominance of one group results in higher or lower carbon standing stocks and export production. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your clear presentation, Griselda. It's very interesting to see the, how the seasonal changes and uh, you estimate like the reasons under behind that. So um, uh, we are half done of our session and I would like to remind our audience, you're free to leave the questions to our speakers in our Q&A box, or you can also ask the question directly to our speaker in the Q&A session. So here is our uh, fourth speaker, Sam. And uh, I would like to introduce Sam to you that Sam is an ecophysiologist at the Institute of Marine Research in Norway. His research uses physiology to explain the ecological distribution, both temporal and spatial, of species important to both ecosystem function and services. He works with a number of local and global programs to future-proof advice to industry and government and develop interventions for the sustainable use of marine resources. So over to you, Sam. Okay, thank you. Uh, share my screen. Am I sharing okay? Yes. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to talk today. Um, I'm going to talk about some work which we've been doing looking at metal pollution, specifically mine waste, um, and putting this in the context of climate change. Uh, I don't have time to talk about all this work we've been doing over the last few years, but I thought I'd focus on one particular field in the Arctic, in Norway. So first of all, I'm just going to introduce um, the issue of mine waste in context of climate change, talk a little bit about this specific case study and the experiment we've run, or one particular experiment in detail, uh, talk a little bit about physiological effects, the effects of metal pollution, um, and the interactions with uh, climate change, particularly ocean acidification, and then summarize. So it's estimated that 23 million people around the world are actually affected by either past mining, so the legacy of mining, or present mining. Um, and almost half a million kilometers of waterways around the world are actually affected by this. This comes from a recent study in uh, science and just a few months ago. And in the Arctic regions, there's a lot of legacy effects, for example, in Alaska, um, Russia, Scandinavia, but particularly in Scandinavia and Norway, we also have these effects of present mining activity. And that's partly because Norway is one of the very few countries in the world, there's really only a couple now, that still permits mine waste to be dumped directly into the marine environment. So this is mine waste directly into the field. 
This has a little bit to do with the history of mining in Norway, as well as the unique topography of Norway. If you think about it, we have a lot of mountains that go straight into the sea. And so when the industry developed in the 1800s, it was easy just to take the mountain effectively and put it into the field. Later, it was thought that maybe this is actually a good idea because as if with the very steep topography of Norway, if you put your mine waste up high, it's going to actually sort of wash down into the terrestrial ecosystem and perhaps cause more damage. It was thought if you put it in the bottom of these deep troughs, you know, 100, 200 meters deep, that maybe it was actually a better place to put it. Unfortunately, we know now through modeling activities of our group and others, which I don't have time to talk about today, but particularly the fine fraction of this can actually go quite a long way beyond the seal of the field and can actually um, have biological effects beyond the planned or permitted area. The mine tailings themselves, although they're rich in metals, only actually have a few percent of the actual ore itself because obviously most of the ore is extracted. This mine waste is actually mixed with uh, fresh water to start with, they're mixed with salt water, fluctuation chemicals are used through the process, and it's dumped to the bottom of the fields. Now, in Norway, these uh, permits range from just a few thousand tons to actually 4 million metric tons a year. So this is a mine near the um, border with Russia, and it can actually has a permit for 4 million metric tons per year. So this is large amounts of material entering the marine environment. And between 10 and 20 percent of these tailings are actually these very fine particles. And we really know very little. And it's only due to some modeling which has been done recently and our group and others that we can see that this actually distributes quite a long way for particularly this fine particles. Now, there's environmental impact assessments obviously needed for this um, new tailing uh, deposit sites. And IMR are constantly working with the government to try and improve these assessments. But ultimately, the discharge permits are granted by the Norwegian Environment Agency. And this isn't a small issue. So throughout Norway, there's a whole range right from the um, border with Russia all the way to the southern tip of Norway of active mining sites, old mining sites, mining sites which have been given permission and haven't started because of political reasons or permits which are ongoing and activity which is actually dumping at the moment. Today, I'm going to focus on one particular field, which we've worked on a lot. We've worked on a number of these fields, but this is one um, in Arctic Norway. It's Rapifjorden in the far north. And it has a history of mining activity in the 1970s. And approximately one million tons of mine tailings were dumped in the field. And you can see here from the sonar maps, you can actually see these um, cones on the bottom where they dumped up all this mining waste into different cones. And over time, these can shift and move. And that's something we're working on at the moment. And we know that this waste is enriched in a number of metals, um, particularly copper. Now, this was in the past, but um, the area is still profitable, evidently, for mining. And in the 2015, a new permit was given by the Norwegian government. Now, when you think in the 70s, one million tons was dumped in total. The new permit is actually for 2 million tonnes per year to be dumped into this field. We're not talking small amounts here. And this discharge activity, when it starts, will last decades. OK, we're effectively removing a mounting and putting it into a field. This is large scale mining. We also know from the work in this field and others that the legacy effects of these mine tailings will last at least 50 years. We still see effects from the um, mining that stopped in the 70s it's probably going to affect longer. So we have to give advice on something which is going to last well into next century. We also know, obviously, that the environment is going to be very different then in terms of warming and also coastal acidification. This is a big issue in Norway. Um, it's a political issue. Uh, the hearings that we contribute to, both at local and national government, um, we also contribute to court cases within our project up to the EU level. So this is a real issue. It also touches on sensitive issues such as land use rights by indigenous Sami people. And it's important therefore that our advice we give is balanced and also that the advice we give is future-proofed. Uh, the, the Environment Agency at the moment says the copper needs to be risk assessed. Uh, obviously copper, it's a copper mine. This will be the highest levels. 
But we also need to realize that the concentration in the actual waste going into the field has some relationship with what's leached, but also the chemistry of those particular metals, as well as the pH and temperature of the environment has a lot to do with how these uh, metals are actually leached from the sediment into the field over time. And as we know from excellent talks we've heard today already, we the Arctic is changing faster than most regions on the planet when it turns in carbonic chemistry. We know pH is changing quicker in these environments with other carbonic chemistry parameters. And this is even more so in the coastal environment. So in these Arctic fields, we also have these additional drivers of precipitation patterns changing, salinity, runoff, ice cover, eutrophication, which also have more forcing on coastal acidification of the environment. So if you like, in these environments, we have this sort of perfect storm of large changes in carbonic chemistry, as well as dumping of mining waste. And yet, despite the fact that we know this mining waste will have effects long after the end of this century, we know environment will be different. Our advice to government is only based on present environmental conditions. What effects do these metals have now? And this is obviously a big problem that a number of us are thinking about and trying to push the government. Um, because the toxicity of these mining sediments is likely to change due to climate change. And at the moment, we're just not future proofing this advice. So over the last few years with this project we run, we've actually had a number of different experiments. I don't have time to talk about all of them today, but just an example, I'll talk about this one. This was a very standard kind of climate change incubation. We had the plus three degrees from ambient, we had the ambient PCO2, and then a 1000 microatmosphere PCO2 prediction for the future. Within each of these treatments, we had mining sediment. So this is actually collected from the historic mine site in Rappafjord using grabs. It's uh, sieved and the biology removed. And then we have a control sediment, which is actually our just inert crushed granite, also sieved to the same particle sizes. And we experienced a number of animals over these eight week incubations, but I'm going to focus on these two bivalves today, which are ecologically and commercially relevant, the carpet shell and the ocean cohog. So getting into some of the physiological effects we see, this is clearance rate. So this, if you like, is the rate at which they're feeding on particles. We actually see no significant effect in this experiment of PCO2 or mine sediment. Um, in other studies, we have seen effects, significant effects of mine sediment. This is probably less to do with maybe the um, metal contamination, but also to do with just the fact that you have a high amount of inorganic particles of a similar size in some cases as their food. So this is obviously going to have an effect on their filtering capabilities. And we're actually running some more experiments on this, particularly at fine fractions this year. So watch that space. Uh, metabolic rate. In terms of this experiment, we also showed no effect of CO2 or mine tailings when it came to the ocean cohog. Um, however, when it came to carpet shells, we did see this increase in oxygen uptake with, or the cost of survival, if you like, with um, ocean acidification. And this is a very common response we've shown in other experiments, um, particularly with aquaculture, across a whole range of bivalve species. So this is a very common response, but we didn't see any interaction with the mine sediment. So we don't see a sort of energetic trade-off or longer energetic effects in terms of an interaction between CO2 and mine sediments. However, when we look at the mortality over the course of these experiments, we definitely see an interaction. We see that elevated PCO2 and mine sediment treatments have much greater mortality in both species. So either the elevated PCO2 is affecting the toxicity of the metals or the metals are affecting the animal's ability to cope with elevated PCO2 and ocean acidification. As I said before, this it doesn't appear to be an energetic trade-off thing that takes time. This appears to be something that happens quite quickly and the ma majority of this mortality happens in the first couple of weeks. So we were thinking, what is going on here? And we started then to look at acid-base balance of these organisms. So this is how organisms maintain their internal pH. So this is how you maintain acid-base homeostasis. So if you have an increase in PCO2 in the environment, you naturally get an increase in PCO2 within the organism. It's under control sediment in the carpet shell. This is met, a very common response across lots of organisms, 
with an increase in bicarbonate. So the animals mobilize internal bicarbonate to buffer the effect of this PCO2 and actually maintain homeostasis, maintain pH within the animal. If we look at mine sediment, we see this increase in PCO2. However, we don't see the ability to maintain bicarbonate. So these animals under this metal toxicity cannot actually mount a buffering response. This leads to acidosis internally and ultimately um, lower survivorship. In the cohog, we see the same effect. So we say, okay, we see increased PCO2 inside the animal as PCO2 increases in the environment. However, in control sediment, this is again matched, very common response with increased bicarbonate. But in the mining sediment, we don't see the ability to increase bicarbonate. There's something with the metal toxicity stopping these animals actually mounting a buffering response, leading to again acidification of the animal internally and death ultimately. Now, we wondered what this could be, and we think this is actually linked to enzyme activity. So there's a number of enzymes important in the organism in the increase in bicarbonate, such as sodium potassium ATPase, um, maybe uh, carbolic anhydrase. And this year we ran another experiment, which actually had five different pHs. And we looked specifically at these enzyme activities and preliminary results do appear to show that it's these enzyme activities which is affected. But we only finished that experiment in September and uh, the results are still being analyzed. So again, watch that space. So in summary, we know the discharge activity from these mines is as long as legacy effects in other environments and other places around the world is done to actually have effects into next century. But at the moment, all our advice is just based on the conditions we see now. And we need to do something about this. We need to do more work into looking at the bioavailability and leaching of metals and how that's affected by carbonic chemistry, as well as how interactions and, um, between the toxicity of metals and climate change affect the physiology of organisms. We can see that this, at least in this case, doesn't appear to be a long term energetic effect, but in actual fact, we do see increases in the effect of mind sediment on mortality. And again, this is linked to this inability of these animals under this metal stress to mount a simple bicarbonate response. Future work, as I've said, we're going to keep looking at this idea of uptake, bioavailability of metals. We have samples going off next year and also increased work on the enzyme. Look at the actual mechanisms behind this. But obviously this work has important implications for the advice we give here at IMR. It's important we future-proof the advice in the context of climate change. And this has implications for other industries, which are very important at the moment, big debates within Norway and other regions, for example, deep sea mining or other metal pollution from aquaculture, for example. And then I just wanted to leave you with one final idea. You, you see a lot of multi-stressor studies where we talk about temperature and plastics or PCO2 and metals and all these sort of links together and you have huge amounts of these studies, but often they're looked at equally, sort of temperature, CO2, metal. And I think what we need to change the way we think a little bit, because climate change drivers aren't just another multiple stressor. They are, in fact, the shifting baseline to which all other anthropogenic drivers need to be studied in the context of. So we need to think about climate change as the baseline which is changing, and these other changes need to be in that context. So I just thought I'd leave you with that thought. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Sam, for your very organized presentation. It's really nice conclusion and implication here. Yeah, I agree. We need to be more practical when we think about ocean acidification's impact on our life. And thank you so much. And now uh, we are here for our fifth speaker. Our fifth speaker is Anna. And Anna is a phys physical oceanographer working with both observations and modeling of ocean hydrography and circulation in the Arctic Ocean, the Northern Norwegian fjords, and the Baltic Sea, currently coordinating the development of Marine Atlantic Arctic Distributed Observatory, bridging over different disciplines and aiming to leverage our scientific outcomes and increase the observational capacity. 
in the Atlantic European sector of the Arctic Oceans. So here we have Anna. Anna, you ready to share your slides? Yes, I hope so. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear and you. And well. see the full slide. Yes, it worked perfectly. Yeah, all right. Yeah, so this will then not be a scientific results in, in that perspective, but something that we hope then to uh, establish for advancing our scientific output. Um, and I'm going to start with the background, and maybe uh, the crowd here is familiar with the original DBO, the pioneering DBO in the Bering Strait area and Buford Sea. But uh, there has been, I mean, and it's always this discussion of uh, how, um, the need for bridging between disciplines and bridging between different observational efforts and also shorter term projects uh, that, that sort of lose momentum every now and then in between the gaps in time before uh, the next uh, project pitches in. And then, so, so back in uh, the early century in the 20, um, in the 2000, that decade, uh, there were already big projects in this area and, and some momentum then to bring it all together across disciplines. And, and try to standardize or harmonize uh, the, the way of doing things to, to pitch into a common time series. Sorry, I'm having trouble. Yeah, no, I should just minimize all the windows so that I see what I'm presenting. Um, so this is more, the, you know, the organizational framework for making something a little bit more consistent. Uh, and, and it's about mainly the ship-based uh, sampling uh, in this region uh, and overall uh, whatever uh, comes next it's about the uh, marine part and ship based um, and these are the, the dedicated stations along for now at least eight transect lines because the main objective has been then to make sort of a de change detection array so they are situated in sites with high productivity, biodiversity, and also high rates of biological uh, change. So uh, different disciplines, different platforms, uh, different than uh, cruises, but pitching into sort of the same time series. And that was the idea of putting this uh, uh, through and also the there were different stages in, of course, the first implementation phases, uh, but also finally endorsed by the Pacific Arctic Group and may, many interagency organs and funding agencies in the United States and Canada. But yeah. Um, and I should also stress that this is, yeah, uh, also stretching to the Asian side, uh, uh, the collaborative network. Uh, but the concept then itself, it is then trying to embrace the whole ecosystem. So it hosts, you know, everything from uh, hydrography and the physical components and the environmental parameters uh, through uh, all the biology and chemistry in the, all the different layers of the ecosystem uh, that are needed to describe its functioning and, and the changes. And here you see, uh, in the picture, the, the set of core parameters that have been um, used throughout the, the time then to, to try to uh, standardize and harmonize the methods around these at least. But it doesn't mean that people need to do only those things, of course. We, we sort of stick to our us usual business, but report back on, on these core parameters. Otherwise, the, the sort of the concept builds some very sort of basic things, which, you know, you know, we just have a cruise matrix or a cruise table and quite simple parameter files with metadata uh, where then the scientific community should just be quite swift in sharing um, both in the planning stage, but also, of course, then coming back with new samples uh, so that it the sampling and the, the programs and the results become more transparent. 
And now, some decades later, there are some better tools for this already in place, right? With the online, uh, well, the data portals, the metadata portals being quite, uh, the, the, the business being a bit easier to cope with and the punching in of data perhaps being more regularized al already. And then we had to remember that this started some time ago. And there was definitely an advancement in uh, in the scientific collaborations there in terms of scientific papers and also joint cruises and strategies uh, for the future. So good ideas, they tend to spread. And of course, we've uh, had our eyes on that as I'm coming from the Atlantic sector then the European sector. And we all are involved in long-term uh, monitoring efforts perhaps and programs. Uh, that have uh, nowadays been running maybe for over three decades, uh, as long as that in some of the regions. Uh, but we haven't really been as organized uh, as, um, as the DBO itself. So this is the time for us then, we thought to, to try to establish this, at least in the Atlantic sector. And uh, we also have uh, then the Siberian uh, sector emerging also with not new monitoring because that has been uh, happening for quite a long time with the neighbors project, et cetera, but with establishing this DBO network and the routines. And also to not forget here, although a little bit hidden in the corner, the, the Davis Trade Buffing Bay DBOs that also have very nice long-term uh, time series as we've seen. So this is for them coordinating the efforts. And now in the panarctic sense, although as you can see yourself also, there are still some gaps that perhaps need to be better filled as well. And um, for our own part in the ADBO, uh, we have the timetable um, of, of the Arctic Passion Project now to, to sort of, uh, bring up some sort of first proof of concept, uh, at least here in the ABBO region, uh, spanning the project time. And the, most of its development happens uh, at the open meetings, and there are two regular meetings per year, uh, the Arctic Summit Week and also the, uh, the fall meetings. So we follow the concept of the Pacific DBO there as well. And during that time, we should just put this in place, not make anything new really, but try to then decide on what our checklist uh, in this network from planning to through implementation and then to the scientific compiling should be. So the typical ADBO uh, checklist, which we also then uh, hopefully bring out the Panarctic scope. Uh, so there are some components, of course, to put in place quite yet. We are mid uh, in the middle of the project right now. And also a difficulty for us maybe in this sector, but for the whole network is how to ensure continuity also ahead of time or ahead in time after this particular project um, ends. Um, so trying to remain uh, alive and kicking for a long time onward. Uh, just some attention on the upcoming events then to our next steps in the development, the well-established PAG and DBO, the Pacific DBO meet in Tokyo uh, just next week or the week after that. Um, and then uh, it's our turn also in the Atlantic version to meet in Sopot. And that's where we sort of do this exchange of the um, reports for results, the scientific outcome for the 2023 season, uh, and also a bit on the out uh, the, the onward view for 2024. Uh, and that's also where we bring in the, our connections to the parallel Panarctic system efforts, as for example, the Arctic Hub, right? So of course, we are many people trying to collaborate across both scales and disciplines. And for our part, also, I'll bring the attention to the ADBO. We would try to do a workshop with hands-on data compiling of the our first tentative results for this year to um, around uh, our main 
key sites um, and also to bring forward this checklist on, on metadata practices that we haven't really got into for our own sake. And the last then is the Panarctic scope gathers uh, and develops more through the Arctic Science Summit Week. So we just got the clearance for our community meeting there for Thursday, 21st of March. And, and we will get back to agendas and stuff about that. You're very welcome to participate. And yes, sorry, thank you for your attention. I have no clue about time here, but leave you with the links. Thank you very much, Anna. It's great to see that you have done so much work to building up this community and putting up this network together. It's really amazing. So now it's time for our last but not the latest speaker. Um, our last speaker is uh, Pirlo. So Pirlo is a <clears throat> marine evolutionary physio a uh, logist based at the University of Quebec in Canada. His research is at the interface between physiology, eco uh, ecology, and evolution, and evolution, and aims at defining geographical patterns of physiological diversity and organisms' ability to respond, cope, and evolve under undergoing combined climate and global changes focusing particularly on marine invertebrates. So here we would like to know like what here to have for us today. I'm gonna to share my screen now? Yes, please. I hope you can see the full screen version. Yes. Okay. So thank you. Thanks a lot for the invitation to share with you some Ideas and data work is done by myself and but in particular students and postdoc working with me and other uh, esteemed colleague, very dear uh, friends as well. So um, a lot of other people have already given a really nice setting so I don't have to go through uh, the, the, the issue and challenges environmentally speaking that uh, are undergoing in the Arctic area, um, but I'm gonna focus on the biology uh, of organisms and the fact that we have now a, a pretty solid understanding of direct impacts or, or some drivers, uh, as some, like for example, Sam has outlined uh, before. Um, in some cases, for example, ocean warming come from a tradition of thermal biology research that has a really strong theoretical basis. But ocean acidification had to catch up and largely speaking, broadly speaking, has done this through a number of contributions that has set uh, a number of, uh, well, good ideas on the relative sensitivity and vulnerability of different taxonomic group, as you can see here on the right of the screen from algae, uh, to invertebrates and algae again. However, uh, we have so we have developed an appreciation for the fact that taxa and phyla differ uh, sometimes greatly, but even species that come from very uh, close groups from an evolutionary perspective um, can differ in the way they respond according to their level of adaptation to certain conditions and the level of acclimatization. Um, however, we have a lesser appreciation for how population may respond in general and uh, and we'll see in particular for, for Arctic uh, species or Arctic subarctic species. But why does this matter? Why should we look at why, uh, why population within population actually vary? Why different population, sorry, why different species within uh, them uh, differ? And the reason is that if we actually have an idea how different population respond, we can produce a more accurate estimates. So avoid to over and underestimate by just taking one population as an example, it might behave differently. Um, we can preserve biodiversity, both as in terms of traits, but also in terms of genetics uh, across the population that may span uh, a different range uh, of expansion. And we can also uh, actually have better information for regional management of stocks. Not, not least important, the fact that variation within the population among individuals is a subject for evolution, given in particular the marine organism, multicellular organism have very, very low rate of uh, mutation. Uh, we can only hope that there's enough variation uh, in natural population to have some individual that might repopulate, re save uh, population, genetically speaking. So there's a couple of examples that have shown these to lower, lower luxury, both in the uh, northern and southern hemisphere. And uh, uh, on the left, you can see here, a study to look at common uh, periwinkle that we carried out in Plymouth when I was there, uh, looking at how 
uh, different populations along the gradient from Spain to Norway are adapted to control condition, the white dots you can see here, but they are locally adapted. And now this level of local adaptation uh, play uh, in defining local and regional responses to high CO2, which are the black dots. This was the work carried out in part by a PhD student, Eddie Milatunan, who passed away, unfortunately, a few years ago. Uh, and then we completed uh, by, by adding some other uh, work. But I want to acknowledge his, uh, his contribution, and he was a great, a great man. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see here uh, another example uh, from Chile in particular, where they compare different population of the same species uh, living under different PCO2 variability conditions, showing again how important it is to look at this local signal to define how sensitive or, or tolerant a species could be overall across the different population that compose it. But what about the Arctic species? And I would broaden it to Arctic subarctic, because some species, of course, live across a greater area than the Arctic Circle. Um, but we know very little. There's very little uh, comparison, in particular, for the difficulty in accessing northern northern area or the lack some time of a laboratory facility that constrains them to constrains us to transport them to southern latitude. It's funny I say southern latitude in Quebec, uh, where my friends in Italy consider me to be very Nordic now, of course. Um, and also the idea that sometimes you can only access this area by boat and so limit some, some type of work that can be done uh, aboard uh, research vessels. I'll bring to their attention two projects, one carried out by Peter Tor in collaboration with myself, Sam Dupont, another colleague, uh, where we compare the metabolic rates and metabolomic profile, as well as ingestion rates of three population of Arctic, uh, uh, Arctic, well, the Arctic copepods, Calvinus glacialis, which you know to be a keystone species in coastal areas, so very important for the functioning of uh, the food chain. What we did, we collected and experimented in relatively good facilities, so we were lucky to be able to access good structure in Billefjord, uh, in uh, Kongsfjord, and in Disco Bay, in, oops, in western, uh, western uh, Greenland, where we uh, exposed uh, copepods to a gradient of pH. You can see here, very broad. Uh, they wasn't representing necessarily a scenario, but just to have a, the ability to later model the responses of the species. Uh, and that's one of the great limitations of working in scenario in the past. It's very useful and have given lots of answers. But gradient will help us to model uh, the responses and to identify thresholds and tipping points in biological system, which is something really needed by exercise like IPCC or uh, GOAN, etc. Uh, so we measure metabolic rates, ingestion rates, and metabolic profile to the individual level. So we were able to refine some techniques like using LTMS in a single copepodite, so larval stages of uh, juvenile stages of the copepods. We focus in particular the presentation and results on copepodite 4, C4, and copepodite 5, C5. What we find there were, as you can see already, difference in responses, either the intensity or actually present substance of responses to a degree of pHs uh, for uh, ingestion rates, uh, sorry, metabolic rates in black uh, and ingestion rates in white. You can see that the cost of living metabolic rates increases uh, with, um, uh, sorry, I actually uh, inverse this, the black ingestion rates um, that decreases with lower pHs and metabolic rate that increases. For copepodot 4, at least for Kongsfjord and Billefjord, but not for Disco Bay. In copepodot 5, we found no responses, probably due to the fact they are preparing for the adult phase, uh, et cetera. So the important message from this is that not only population differ, but they differ greatly. And when you put together, interpolate metabolic rates and ingestion rates as a response to acidification, uh, we have a reduction in scope for growth, the ability to grow and to put in energy into immune system responses to other functions. Um, and reproduction by 90% in corn fields. But the bill of your population for local conditions and or, and or local adaptation level had a reduction in scope for growth of 50%, which is quite serious and worrying, actually. Um, this Kobe had apparently no quite ever tolerant population to a range of pH conditions. We have a metabolomic underpinning for this, but I'm not going to go in detail. Uh, it's a one population study that we published with Peter uh, in 2022. I see mistakes in the presentation. Um, so overall, we can see that C4 copper products are extremely sensitive to acidification, contrary to C5, but the differ difference are important across populations. So if you would have used Disco Bay, we would have say copper products 4 are safe, they're very tolerant. If you would have used Billefjord, you would have say, no, they're really, really sensitive. So the answer is some population are, some are not, and this is important for conservation purposes, or even for introducing concept of evolutionary rescue, recovering the loss of some population using nearby genetically closed population, they have somewhat a higher level of adaptation. 
I was important also you realize that we use an integrative approach. We focus on scope for growth, the integrated metabolic rates and ingestion rates and add the metabolomic to explain the pattern. So to avoid to do the one point, so the one point conclusion, it's very risky to put everything onto one, one uh, biological variable to say whether the species is tolerant or sensitive, but a bit better with two, better with three, better with seven, but actually the best would be that we interlink them in some way, we integrate them. And the best way forward for this possibly, although it's extremely expensive, time consuming, is that to recreate natural corresponses. Whether we do this at the whole organism level or, or cellular level or any sort, up to the gene expression. Um, I want to acknowledge that I develop a lot of, well, I am learning actually through my colleagues, Diana Madeira and Carolina Madeira, which happen to be two twin molecular marine biology from Portugal. And they're two amazing scientists who uh, are really championing this idea of, of this elaborate integration to stop trusting in a point, but actually work on pathways that are more complex and anchor across the entire organism and the numb to actually having a link to fitness consequences. I rapidly move on to the second project, which is a large project that involves a number of students. I'll in particular show the result from Ella Guichelli's project on the response of to ocean acidification of the northern shrimp, which is extremely iconic and important for our cultural heritage in Norway, Sweden, uh, Canada, and Greenland, and so on. And we expose different populations here in warmer area here and also in subarctic conditions uh, because of the Labrador current. Uh, and we strive to take what population from the north, but transportation, as I said, were challenging. We were never able to transport enough individuals south. To carry out these experiments with three different temperatures and two pHs, I'll focus on pH results, uh, under control and ocean acidification condition, measuring again metabolic rates, aerobic scope, enzyme activity, and in this case, multiomics. So we are going to have the, the full suite of uh, measures that I just showed you before, not presented today, of course. Um, it's important to show that there is a, a certain level, a significant level of mortality caused by, uh, by uh, low pH exposure. You'll see pH a bit lower because they're lower in there where we work. So natural conditions are lower than the, the one uh, from the future. I'm oh, sorry, lower, lower than the, 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 global, the global average, of course, today. Uh, we found only one significant interaction between origin of the population collected and pH, and it was to do with difference between two population only. So you can see that the result is very subtle. There is apparently at the whole organism level, and we look at metabolic rates, very low level of interpopulation variation. This in itself can be worrying if you have high level of mortality that we see to warming acidification and hypoxia in the species, because it means that there's little variation. And this seems to be in part com com confirmed by some genetic study by Lang. However, but we changed uh, uh, our, le our um, optic. We noticed a lot more responses, uh, a lot of different between populations, uh, the poor population. And you can see in particular that some respond to pH in isolation or to the pH in interaction with temperature, meaning that uh, there are complex and different responses across population. When we put this in a scale of vulnerability, we can say that the subarctic population is the most vulnerable actually, when we consider the integration of all the responses across the different scales the survival level, uh, the aerobic performance at the organism level or cell level. So we encourage to go in these directions. It's extremely elaborate. It takes years to master it. And we're not even there. Uh, we are now working on publishing protein and lipids. Uh, some of gene expression is published, some metabolites are published, all organisms are published, but we are really integrating. And we want to use the, the northern streams as, an, as a case of study. And we, we strive to actually get to those northern populations to see, see whether we see even greater vulnerability level than the southern one, or vice versa. So, and Lisa, I thank you for taking a little more time than I was supposed to. Thank you very much, Fiero. It's a very wonderful uh, presentation. I really like the way that you conclude presentations. Really important to think about things in different layers. Uh, so here we have um, our question and answer session now. So. Um, I hope that uh, you can, um, uh, so our uh, listeners, you can either type your questions in the Q&A box. I already seen there's one question for Tonya. Or if you have any other question, you can raise your hand and directly ask our speaker here. So um, here is one question for Tonya. So how does Pacific water get on West Greenland shelf against the general cyclonic circulation. Uh, would you like to answer the question here? 
yes, yes, I would. Uh, and I'd like to share my screen again to answer the question. Sure. Um, so I'm really glad. Uh, thank you for this question. I included an extra slide that I want to share to answer it. Uh, here we go. So I had the same question and I've actually been working with Paul Myers, who's a professor from the University of Alberta. And he uses this high resolution model, the NEMO model to look into ocean circulation. And so I asked him uh, if he had any um, model output that could help answer this question. And he provided me with this lovely video simulation, which is showing an idealized, well, actually I should start off by saying that this is a passive tracer simulation, and it's a tracer of Pacific waters uh, entering the Canadian Arctic archipelago and Baffin Bay. And so what it's showing uh, with the colors is an idealized thickness of how much Pacific water is present in the water column within the upper 150 meters. And so with this simulation, you can see that at some times in this video, there will be a pulse of Pacific water that moves from the Baffin Island current over towards um, the northern end of the West Greenland shelf. And based on the model output, this seems to be due to just a uh, change in the wind direction at some times. And so it does happen sporadically. Um, quite frequently. And so, um, yeah, that's that's the answer I have for you as to how Pacific waters get over onto the West Greenland shelf. There are these um, changes in wind direction that sort of changes the Ekman transport in the region, but I'm not an expert on how that works. <laughs> so that's my best answer for you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any other questions from our audience? Mm -hmm. I think uh, there was a message that uh, someone has uh, had up. Uh, uh, Lisa Mathis. Mathis. Oh, right. Um, I don't know if she's around still. Lisa, do you have a question for our speakers? Sorry, I just got a message from Lisa. Uh, tell them there's no questions from her. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, so if we don't have any further questions, uh, do we have any like final words from our speakers? Or it's really great sessions and I learned so much and so glad to see like we got so many speakers together and giving the talks about arctic research in different levels so if you have some things that you want to share yes. yeah i just can say i can also i can just thank all the speakers and organizers for for this uh, really interesting session and it yeah it was really different aspects and interesting all and i have a lot lots of questions but <laughs> I, I will take them later <laughs> but there are lots of good things yeah thank okay. you and yeah if someone else wants to say something from the speaker yes yes please mm. yes i i recently participated i want to just share this but uh, i know that i'm talking to a very sensitive uh, public but i recently participated to a uh, a synthesis exercise with the AMAP group uh, to assess the effect of acidification in Arctic ecosystems on biological system in particular. And I had to review on, well, of course, like I've worked on the Northern Trim, so I knew what was going on more or less, um, but also another species that I, had, I don't work directly. And I was quite uh, impressed not in a positive way how little there is in comparison. There's always study on Arctic species, but never in Arctic populations or very, very rare, rarely. And it's, it's really worrying actually, because we, we don't have a good grip of, of, of those local adaptation level. And, and even if some population may rescue them from the South, if they get, get to get there through current and physical and chemical and ecological barriers, uh, it represents a risk of great genetic diversity loss. And so I, I just re-encourage everybody or push everybody around you to, to try to actually get the research there uh, with all the logistics dif difficulties in getting there and working there where 
the build of structure, uh, but also to push if you're in a position to build research structure uh, in those in those areas so that people can be deployed as it happened with the helicopter in, in Canada some time. And uh, we, are, we are building, for example, one research station and planning to build two more in really high, in the Baffin Bay area, et cetera, so or Ellesmere, et cetera, here. But it's been taking years, so try to advocate for this because it's important. There is a physical presence and logistic basis for undertaking all, all the chemical, physical, model, model biological work that, that we carried out and other generation will. Yes, Sam, please. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. I think this idea of looking at populations, particularly across natural gradients and analogs, is incredibly important, as Pierre said. Um, and just to draw people's attention to the natural um, analog working group within ESAS, so analog art, which a number of us are involved in, um, which actually promotes exactly what Pierre is talking about, you know, it promotes bringing the um, chemists together with the biologists to do their sampling in the same place. Because this is something we've often had a problem with in the past, that the biologists go off on their cruises for plankton, chemists go off on their cruises, physiologists do their stuff. It takes far too long for everyone else, so we annoy everyone. And, you know, developing new techniques where we can do physiology from markers, do physiology in the field, across increasing our spatial and temporal resolution of data with chemists is incredibly important. So these are things we're actually working towards. A number of us are involved in that working group as well. So um, look that up if you're interested or emailing me or Agneta. And uh, yeah, I think that's a really important point, Pierre. Thank you very much for very encouraging words. I'm also very motivated. And thank you so much for everyone. And um, I, I really look forward to more research going on from our hub. So with that, um... I think uh, there is one uh, question here. Oh, really? Uh, oh, Sam. yes. Thank you so uh, much. Do we now? Uh, do we do we know the current pH and oxygen levels in Retrafjord? Is the question. Mm. Um, I think there's some work going on. Better people to ask is probably Agneta and Melissa um, about that. Um, we have got some data. Um, it's actually quite seasonal, like a lot of these places. Um, and one of the problems with some of the research we're doing is that we don't have the temporal resolution at the moment in some of these places. Um, the pH does change a lot. There's a large riverine input. So it is affected also by the input of the river seasonally and the melt. Um, it's also affected by the bloom. Uh, and we know that. So, um, yeah. I don't know if Ignetta knows more about um, pH and Rapperfjord and the covenant chemistry of Rapperfjord. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, any further questions? Your last chance. Um... Okay. So with this, I would like to thank all those organizers, moderators, and our speakers for such a great session. And we thank you, the audience, for joining us for the OA Week 2023. Please do not forget to consult the website and to register for any other sessions that may interest you. If you would like to stay up to date with the Go On community, consider signing up as a Go On member on our website. And to discover more about ocean acidification research for sustainability, please scan this QR code. Thank you all and see you next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>